Welcome back to Keeping the World Company on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. So today we're going to talk about, yes, Trump said he did say you won't have to vote again. What does that foretell for the country? You won't have to do it anymore. Four more years. You know what? It'll be fixed. It'll be fine. You won't have to vote anymore, my beautiful Christians. I love you, Christians. I'm a Christian. I love you. Get out. You got to get out and vote. In four years, you don't have to vote again. We'll have it fixed so good you're not going to have to vote. Our co-host for this discussion is Tim Apicello. Our guest for the show is Gene Rosenfeld, independent scholar. Welcome to the show, both. So uh, let me let me just say that um, I think that the the comment that he made and he has been making is plain English, and uh, he can try to walk that back. Uh, people can say, no, he didn't really mean that, but it's English. And if you're running for president, you've got to be serious about what you say, don't you? Um, and he's saying you put me in office and I'll be there for life. I'll take care of everything. It'll be fixed and fine. I will be a dictator. I will destroy the democracy. You won't have to vote again. I love you Christians. It's really simple. That's what he's saying. So let me ask you what you think about what he's saying and what does it mean to you? Tim, let's begin with you. What is he saying when he says you won't have to vote again? Well, it can mean one of two things. Um, the cynical side of me says that um, the next election, if I'm alive, uh, we won't have the free and fair elections. The other side of me says that uh, he'll be so popular that he won't need their vote because the rest of the, of the country will overwhelmingly reelect him for uh, a third term. Wait a minute. The Constitution limits it to two terms. Well, he'll have four years to change that now, won't he? <laughs> He's going to fix it. It'll be fine. Well, that's Everything what he said in this fine. quotation. He said, in four years, we'll have it fixed so good you won't have to vote again. That's a direct quote of what you just played. Yeah, and you know, just earlier today, we had a show about, you know, which included a lot of issues, but um, what what exactly does he plan to do on day one and yeah. becoming a dictator? Uh, well, and let me... does that include, does that include um, throwing the constitution out on all these points and um, never having to vote again? Not to divert from this topic of the show, but in the previous show that you and I uh, just had, um, we should expect all sorts of outrageous comments from Donald Trump, one being the one he just made in this recording you just said. That's an outrageous statement to make. Uh, the other one is he made at the uh, Black Convention of, or excuse me, the Convention of Black Journalists, uh, basically questioning Kamala Harris's ethnicity and her race. Uh, why is he saying these outrageous things that are, one, going to uh, attract attention, but two, uh, make enemies? Uh, we both believe, or let's, we just discussed, that he needs to divert the attention of the media back onto him because for the last two weeks, uh, Kamala Harris uh, has been in the limelight, and he doesn't like that. That doesn't win elections for him. So, Gene, your, your thoughts about this language? Where is it coming from? What, what is it intending to really communicate and to whom? Well, that's the first question you ask. Who is he speaking to? And he actually tells us in the statement he's speaking to Christians. And this is a statement he made, I think, several weeks ago. Um, so um, it, it's something that was on his mind. Uh, the second thing is that he is messaging to his followers only and to those of like mind, at least in terms of their faith and politics, and trying to draw in more, although there's a question about how many more of his actual base he can appeal to. Um, but very interestingly about the statement, it's a typical statement of a charismatic leader who is saying what his audience wants to hear and recommitting to them that he is going to be the miracle worker that puts it in place. However, he doesn't define what it is. If you listen carefully to the statement, he says it. It will be fixed. You will never have to vote again because it'll all be fixed. But what is the it? And that's where it keeps things deflected 
from any kind of criticism or legitimate concern because he can always redefine what it is. Now, we know that there is this plan from the Heritage Foundation of Project 2025, which has some rather draconian moves to change our social universe, not just our political universe. It has uh, a tremendous amount of, uh, of, of uh, oversight of personal lives and limitations and prohibitions on men and women in terms of their habits and, and means of life. And they're actually going into their bedrooms about what they can do there or not do and why. And it also changes um, the power base because think about it. You won't ever have to vote again if people with children get as many votes as they have children and people who only have cats and dogs can't vote at all. So we know, we know there are some thoughts there about his being dictator on day one, which with the immunity ruling from the Supreme Court, courtesy of John Roberts, our favorite moderate, <laughs> um, he can do whatever he damn well pleases as long as it's regarded as official and presidential. So yes, he can, he can change the votes. He can change the term limits. Uh, he can take over in various and sundry other ways that we have seen happen in human history, not in the United States, but in human history. Bear this in mind, since our Constitution was written, we have expanded the number of votes in this country. Originally, it was only white men with property who got a vote each. Black individuals were only counted for population, for representation as three-fifths of a person. They could not vote. Women could not vote. It's a questionable whether an itinerant man could vote. Only citizens could vote, and that's still the case. However, since then, slaves have been emancipated and people of color vote. Women have finally been emancipated as far as disenfranchisement of the vote is concerned, and they have now voted and are a huge voting block. So he's the first president or presidential candidate to talk about rolling back the votes. And he's sort of compensating for it, in other words that he's given us, by um, having the number of children expand the number of votes that a parent can utilize. He hasn't said whether both parents can count the kids twice, but we know that because he wants a two-parent family, obviously. Um, but if I have three kids, I have four votes. And the cat lady next door may not. So this all is why the Democrats are calling this weird. What does he mean? Who is he talking to? What are his real intentions? Again, he is a chameleon and you cannot pin him down because he'll say one thing one day and he'll deny it the next. He's now saying that Project 2025 has no connection to him He's fired the man who was in charge of it. And we know that that's not the case. We know that that was a blueprint put up by the people who support him and that he's looking forward to getting rid of the civil service and getting rid of a lot of the agencies and putting his own people in place. So, you know, it's, it's now become a silly show. And I think the Democrats are right in mocking what is happening with Donald Trump and his campaign. And yes, I agree with Tim. I think he's trying to get our attention. Hmm, yeah, well, he's making outrageous statements. Uh, the racist uh, statement about uh, Kamala was just today. Um, and there'll be more um, because he wants to get to the top of the news cycle. He wants to be uh, get the attention, as you both said. So I guess my question is, if I'm an ordinary person, and I am listening to these outrageous statements. 
what is what is my reaction? Is my reaction that I won't have to vote again? This be the last time. You know, it's a kind of a pain to vote. Have to wait online. Have to go through all this, um, you know, lobbying and email and campaign business. Uh, maybe it's easier for me not to vote. I'll, I'll let uh, Donald and his friends, advanced and friends, uh, take care of it. That's that's one thing that the average person, you know, maybe not well informed, would would, would take away from this. And then, you know, we, uh, we can argue about how much uh, he, he really will endorse uh, Project 2025, but some of it, uh, which is really very ultra right wing, it's clear that he will. Everybody would agree on that, even if he you know, denies it now. Um, and his statement that uh, he wants to be dictator on day number one and so forth. I mean, there are so many things that he said. So, Tim, I'm, I'm asking, you know, are the outlines forming up, uh, are the statements he is making, do they define him or is it all mush? Well, all the above, it's mush, but it does define him. Uh, the bottom line is this is no different than him coming down the escalator in 2015, uh, blaming our problems on Mexicans. They're, they're, they're rapists, they're, they're, they're murderers. Uh, this is a, the appeal, it says 2015, to those, those white American males that feel a sense of grievance, that feel a sense that they've been pushed in the corner for the last 55 years. And this is Donald Trump on a bullhorn expressing that which they have secretly and quietly thought about to themselves, but couldn't communicate it to anybody else for fear of being labeled a racist, a misogynist, you name it, all the above. Uh, Donald Trump has given permission for those to speak badly, think badly, and act badly. Full permission to do so. Uh, this is no different than what he's been doing for eight plus years. Uh, it's an election time, so it's time to bring out the old playbook. And part of that playbook is uh, making outrageous statements. Uh, dictator for a day, you'll never have to worry about another election. Uh, you name it, the list goes on. But this is a distraction and two... Um, he likes to he likes to divert the conversation back to him. Yeah, it's all about the media. He's he, you know, you can say he's uh, not well educated, but, um, you know, he knows how to play to the media, knows how to get attention. But, Gene, let me ask you this. You know, in the past uh, 10 days, um, Kamala has um, surfaced. She has uh, her star is going way high. She's raising money. She's making very positive speeches. When you watch her speeches, you care. You begin again, again, you begin to care, perhaps as you did before. Um, and that changes the calculus, doesn't it? Um, so he makes this crazy, outrageous statement, and then she gets up there and she talks candidly and honestly and deals with what he's saying. My question to you is uh, looking at the way people react, the way people in the country react, and I guess we can't say you know, the country is, is unified on this, but the various groups, um, but the people do react and, and we have a new element in the conversation. It's Kamala Harris. How does Kamala Harris's emergence as a full throated candidate affect the uh, affect the, the message that Trump is sending? Well, if you've noticed, his comments have become uh very much more like they were when he was the first candidate in a slate of nine Republicans who wanted uh, to become the nominee of the Republican Party in 2015. Uh, if you remember, he had a name for each one of them, and it was not a nice name. And everything he had to say about them was mocking. It was to cut them down to size. And this is deliberate. It's a strategy to make the candidate, your opponent, look lesser and to make you look greater. So because Harris's star has risen, he needs to make his star rise higher. And the way he does that is counterintuitive. It's a, a, a well-known tactic on the part of a charismatic leader to take the rival and make the rival look humiliated or small or both. So he chooses not only negative uh, names for 
Kam Kamala Harris, and he doesn't pronounce her name correctly either. Um, he he chooses um, things which which really humiliate, which tend to humiliate. Saying she would be a play toy for international leaders opposed to the United States, that they would um, look upon her as so weak that she would just be a play toy. Well, that's genius too. Think about the connotations, the different meanings of that phrase, play toy. Um, it means basically this is a fallen woman or she's someone to go have fun with, not to really speak to on important issues. It puts women back in the bedroom or the brothel and back many, many years to a caricature. And this is one way to create in people's minds associations so that when they see her again, they will not just see a serious and uh, intelligent and smart woman uh, who can give as well as get, but they will associate her with some of these past stereotypes that put women in their place. And if you look at the rhetoric since the Republican convention about the opponent, in this case, Kamala Harris, um, it's all negative. It's all designed to humiliate and to uh, cut her down to size because the more effective she is, the more he seems to need this type of tactic, which again is deliberate, um, to stem the hemorrhage of attraction that she is having for these disputed groups. Only a small number of Americans are going to decide this election, relatively speaking. You know, 48% of the people on either side with either party have made up their minds. So we're talking four or five percent of the population. And those are the people that both sides need to appeal to. She's going for the young vote. She's going for the black vote, which they thought was in play before she was the nominee or is going to be the nominee. She's go definitely going for the women's vote. And the nice thing about being a Republican woman married to a Christian nationalist is you have a secret ballot. You can vote any way you want. Who knows? <laughs> Women are devious. You know, they're used to being devious when they're in an oppressive state because they have to use the deviousness to get what they need and what they want. You know, for the first week after she became, you know, um, a candidate, um, he was quiet. And uh, you had the impression that... Uh, Trump was uh, figuring out what he was going to say about her, how he was going to find these insulting words. And, uh, you know, the, and the honeymoon was when he shut up for a few days. But now he's back with the same playbook, as you said, Tim, and he's going to play that out. Uh, and I, I might add, uh, in addition to play toy, he's called her a bum, which is really interesting. So we're, we're talking racism, bigotry, misogyny, we're talking about lies, but he's good at ranking this way. He's good at uh, insulting people, and he will continue to do it. So my question to you, Tim, is, you know, she's pretty smart, and I've always felt that she could handle him in a debate. Not clear that he will actually come to that debate. That's an open question. But how should she handle him? If you were on her campaign committee, what would you advise her to do? Oh, with a smile on my face, I'd say the following. Uh, Donald Trump, about an hour and a half, two hours ago, just on the um, interview at the, the Convention of Black Journalists, said that any time, anywhere, he thinks that um, a mental cognitive test should be administered to any would-be candidate for president of the United States. And he said, and I've taken two and I've passed beautifully. Uh, Kamala Harris would say, I'm with you on this. Let's take the test. Let's take it tomorrow. Uh, I'm not sure what Donald Trump would get in the way of results if it was from a panel of uh, uh, unbiased psychologists, psychiatrists. Uh, you and I have talked about this for quite some time. He's, he's devolving. He's, he's disintegrating uh, month after month in front of the cameras. 
And there's a question of whether or not he's, say, sorry to say it this way, but that shit crazy. Um, so that would be the first thing I do is take him up on his, on his, uh, his own words. And then secondly, um, to address what uh, Michelle Obama said, when they go low, we go high. Stop that. Uh, you said it perfectly in the last show, and that is when they lie, we go after the lie. And that means you're going to lower yourself to their level somewhat, but not completely. But what Donald Trump gets when he gets away with these comments and these horrible things he says is that the Democrats tend to be gentlemen gyms about it. And they, they say, well, we don't want to lower ourselves to their standards. Uh, horse pucky, you address the lie, you address the derogatory language, and you do it not soon after it was made. And then you get to your points about what you're going to do for the country and not against the country. Uh, you got to stand for something, but if you let them take the narrative of lies and, and derogatory statements, uh, I believe uh, what your your message points never get through. They never hit the mark because everyone's still um, lingering about on the the horrible statements made, and you haven't addressed them. So therefore, in this day and age, people start to assume, well, maybe it's true. You know, you make me think of a an incident where. Um... Linda Lingle was campaigning against uh, Ed Case, and um, Ed Case was uh, criticizing her. And, and Lingle, who was very good at this sort of thing, she said, oh, Ed, Eddie, there you go again. Go again. <laughs> there you go again. You're doing it again. Eddie, you've got to stop doing that, um, and, so, and so on and so forth. But... Uh, you know, Gene, what about that? Does does um, does Kamala have the moxie? Does he have the ability to deal with a guy who has a, a lot of skill in insulting people? And how exactly should she do that? How should she play out the debate? How should she play out comments in a in a uh, in responding to his outrageous statements, which he will continue to make? What style would you recommend to her in terms of calling him out? calling out his lies, calling out his insults. She needs to come out on top of that. She needs to be a winner. She needs to be strong. Is she? Can she? How do you suggest she act? She needs to stay on offense and not be distracted by his offensive remarks and to, um, to segue to defense. If somebody is saying something outrageous about you or your policies, and she has some vulnerabilities, we know that, in terms of her policies, and they will hit her hard on that. Take control of the situation. If, uh, for example, uh, she, is, um, she is hit up with failing on dealing with immigration, she should say a few things about that, and then she should immediately segue to her, uh, her, her issue, which is abortion. That's an example in, in the style in which you rebut. You have to rebut, but you can rebut small and offend great. And stay in control of your own message. Don't be distracted. Don't get emotional. Be tough and um, be logical and be consistent with what you're doing. I keep hearing uh, Linda Lingle's comment in my head. <laughs> there you go again, Donald. You can't do that, Donald. <clears throat> and I think I, I'd just uh, like to say for the record that uh, she plagiarized from Ronald Reagan during the debates. <laughs> there you go again. <laughs> that worked for him. That worked for him. You know, the one the one thing I was watching her last night in, in, in clips on MSNBC and I was very impressed with the way she was working the crowd, working the points, and more than more than anything. And I and I told Tim about this before. She had a good nature about her. <clears throat> Excuse me. She had a good nature about her. She was she was not dark and foreboding and threatening at all. She was saying, "Let's let us celebrate the possibility of my election." Um, I, I like you. You like me. Let's let's be together. Me and the ten thousand people who came to my rally, you know. Um, but I but I felt that the attitude she was uh, demonstrating 
was really important. So, Jean, you say uh, she should she should um, you know respond. Um, she should keep control of the narrative, but she should also she should also demonstrate that kind of goodwill, that good nature, that uh, hey, I, I'm I'm ahead of you on this, and you can say what you want, but the crowd they love me. Uh, what do you think about that? Is she able to do that? Have you watched her in a public spectacular like that? She has definitely been able to do that in these 10 days. She has definitely been able um, to, be, to be threatening without being too serious so that she gets a laugh out of her audience and she gets audience uh, participation. She now, there are certain memes and certain statements that the audience plays back to her. That is a skill that is priceless. Now, when you're on a date, debate stage and you're facing your opponent and that's it, and you don't have your support group with you, and you realize how much is riding on this, it's like being an, an Olympic athlete at the moment of truth. You don't know. I mean, that's really the measure of a person, of how they're going to respond. You know, and you don't have any excuses. You can't say, I'm jet lagged, I'm tired, I'm old, I'm this, that, or the other thing. That's your contest. Every charismatic leader faces champions, and his or her future depends on winning that contest. So, this is another tactic, the one she's been using. It's going to be harder to use facing the lone opponent on the stage, however. Um, because he's got a whole armamentarium or he wouldn't be where he is. We all know, I mean, those of us who realize what politics is all about, that a debate really doesn't test how good a president you're gonna be. It doesn't really tell you anything about the heart or soul of this person. It's a performance and you have to be a performer. You're not a statesman or stateswoman. You're not a you're not a a, a public servant. You're you're not a, a popular person. You are basically there in a in a contest. It's it's mano a mano. It's as old as the human race when there's ever been conflict. It's one champion against another champion. And so if you you have a slingshot. And the other guy has a spear. You know, I mean, nobody ever thought of a slingshot. If you think of something different, original, um, engaging, that's performance. That's what we want to see on our screens. And that's what oh, it's all about. Oh, boy. It sounds like a movie I saw. <laughs> so, you know, you know, Tim, um, she said, uh, Kamala said, and I, this really sunk in on me. And she said, if you want to if you want to talk about me, quote, say it to my face, end quote. That's a very powerful statement, isn't it? What well, is precisely. she really saying? What is she saying there when she says that? Well, it says you're 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 running from me. You're cowering from me. I want you on the debate stage. Um, basically, what's implied is I'm going to clean up the floor with you. Uh, I agree with Jean um, about addressing a negative and then pivoting to, you know, a positive. Um, I would only say that you you address the negative, but stay on topic to the negative. Uh, yeah. For example, in immigration, you address the failings of the policy, and rather than pivot off to a different topic, you stay on topic to say what your vision, your plan is to correct. And you take some responsibility. She has to take some responsibility or else people are saying, typical politician claims no responsibility for anything. So she's gonna to have to do a mea culpa in a very small way, then pivot to that same topic and say, this is how we're going to fix it. And then secondly is, um, you, you think- I wish of you wouldn't use that word, fix it. Uh, that, that troubles me, that word, that's a uh, Trump how word. How about correct it? <laughs> so how about that one? <laughs> And then I, I think of the candidates that really were successful on staying on the positive, at the same time knowing how to uh, pivot, you know, defend uh, on the debate stage. And, and, and John F. Kennedy comes to mind, um, certainly Barack Obama and, and Ronald Reagan. I mean, they were both masked, all three were masters of 
staying on a positive message at the same time, not taking any flack from their opponents on stage? Okay, well, we've been talking about, you know, what advice we would give to Kamala Harris. Uh, and we, we really want her to perform really well. Uh, we want her to be the winner. Uh, but what would you, gee, I hate to ask a question like this, what would you advise to Donald Trump? We know that he's going to try to do his playbook uh, from now till the election. He's going to try to insult people and come up with names for them and so forth. What would you advise him um, to win? Well, if he had the capacity to do this and stay on topic, which are two <laughs> big assumptions, um, he would go with his strongest arguments. And those are, number one, the economy, because that economy has not yet trickled down to the people in Appalachia, in the inner cities. Um, the middle class is not completely uh, restored. Um, the Biden initiatives are in the middle of implementation. They haven't, no one has seen the impact of them yet. So uh, they're still vulnerable on the economy and inflation, number one. Number two, immigration. Okay, you can talk about the numbers having gone down, but that doesn't really mean much uh, when you still have millions and millions coming over and you can't handle the crowd. But more than that, they can pivot to their success, which I'm sure was intended, of having uh, arrested the two drug lords that just came over the border, that's been, they can compare that to getting Osama bin Laden, for example, and they can really tout that. Um, then she has to, uh, like any candidate who's been in public life for a long time, experience counts, yes, and she's been dwelling on that. But also, she has taken positions in the past which were popular then, such as Black Lives Matter, defund the police, et cetera, that they can exaggerate out of all bounds and will. Soft on crime, it's an old Republican argument, soft on crime. And she's going to have to figure out how to respond and still stay in control of the floor with that one. So he does have some very good vulnerabilities to show and inconsistencies and the old and new playbook where that is concerned. Um, but that doesn't mean he's going to do that. <laughs> I don't think he can stay on that topic. Well, remember, too, that as time goes on, he's he's going to decline. She, she emerges stronger, but he is likely to decline, uh, whether you give him a, a, a test or not. Um, so I'd just like to uh, ask one other thing. And, and that is this, is, this is really an important battle of rhetoric. That's what we have here. And it's performative, as, as you've both indicated. Uh, and, and the stakes are very high, as you've indicated. Um, because if, uh, you know, if, she, if she loses, we're in for it, uh, for fascism, for autocracy, for whatever Trump decides the word it means. <laughs> and, and that's very, very worrisome. Um, so, you know, I, I worry about the news cycle. I worry about the media. I worry about the media catching on to his his narrative and his negative narrative. And uh, I'd like to offer both of you the opportunity, since we're almost out of time, uh, to speak to that. How is this going to play out? Uh, what's it going to look like in the next, what, three months? Uh, will she have the strength to continue? Uh, will he have some tricks up his sleeve we haven't seen yet? Uh, uh, Tim, why don't you go first? Oh, you know, like the 2016 campaign, um, there were a lot of twists and turns, and I expect the same here in the next three months. Um, as we've already mentioned, uh, for, for candidate Harris, stay on your game plan, stay positive, uh, address that which you're being criticized for. Don't, don't let them, you know, verbally uh, push you around on stage or in the media, uh, but draw a picture of what Americans want to hear, and that is bread and butter issues. And yet, uh, keep a positive message about the country and the future of the country and the future of democracy. Uh, those are things that, that most Americans will gravitate to. 
And in the previous question, you asked, uh, Gene, what, what advice would you give Donald Trump to win? Oh, that's easy for me, because I'd say, Donald, your message is far too great, far too wide, far too broad. You need to focus in specifically to your message to appeal to white supremacists, misogynists, and the extreme national Christians. And don't make your message anything beyond those three population groups. <laughs> okay. Uh, Gene, your, your thoughts, your wrap-up comments? Well, just today I was watching a show in which the interviewer uh, was talking to Fred Trump, the third, uh, who is Trump's nephew, Donald Trump's nephew, and has come out with a book, I think it's called All in the Family, in which he, he really shows who his uncle is. It was his sister, Mary Trump, who came out with the first exposés of Donald Trump as a person. She's a psychiatrist, he's our psychologist, She's not. he's not, but he's been up there. He has a disabled son, for example, that Trump said, well, why don't you just let him die? Um, and he's been very reluctant to come forward, but now he's come forward strategically and is saying that he's gonna vote for Kamala Harris and he's making himself available to campaign for her, do whatever she needs him to do. But what he said to the interviewer was something that needs to be said again and again. He was telling the interviewer, it's the media in 2015 that made Trump. And when asked, well, should the media continue to cover him? And he said, not to this extent, no. He loves it, anything negative, he loves, as long as he's on top of the media game. So she needs to continue to be the performer. She needs to continue to have this rapport with huge groups, spontaneous groups of Americans who play all these little tricks about, you know, white men for Kamala and black women for Kamala and, and, and having her audience repeat back to her like a rock star. She's gotta be a rock star right now. I don't know if she can do that, but she's shown a penchant to do that. And as long as her advisors know that's the way to connect with voters um, by entertaining them to some extent at the same time that you're angling for their support. So I don't think she can carry that on to the debate stage, but she can set the stage for whatever comes by doing that. Doc Wood. Okay, we're out of time. We'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much, Tim Apicella, Gene Rosenfeld, for a very interesting discussion. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Thanks to our viewers for watching. Aloha.